Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, host of Better Off. Today, we're talking about rich people and why they're so anxious. You know, the people that I talk to try to be morally worthy of their wealth because it's so easy to be seen as unworthy, right? There's so many judgments. It's very common to judge wealthy people for over-consuming, for being ostentatious, for being materialistic, right? What they do with their money. They're all trying to avoid the word entitlement, the feeling of entitlement. And that, I think, is, is the stigma itself, right? That sense of being entitled. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. All right. Before you write in, before you go pull your hair out of your head, calm down. And here's why. I have a sociologist as our guest, the interview this week. Her name is Rachel Sherman. She teaches at the New School for Social Research. She wrote a book way back uh, about service and inequality in luxury hotels. It was kind of interesting just to see how workers and guests and managers all interact. That said, her newest book, it's called Uneasy Street, The Anxieties of Affluence. You know, people go bananas. I know I did. I saw the cover and I said to Mark, I don't want to interview. Who cares about these people? They're, oh, poor them. They're millionaires. And they, but I found it actually quite interesting. First of all, it's very well written. The idea that there are changing attitudes about wealth, what does that tell us about other things going on in this society? So that's why it ended up being a very interesting interview. So here's my interview with Rachel Sherman, author of Uneasy Street, The Anxieties of Affluence. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Rachel Sherman, author of Uneasy Street, The Anxieties of Affluence. Welcome to Better Off. Thank you for having me. So we start the program with a very important question. You ready? Yeah. What's the best financial decision you've ever made in your personal life? Wow. Um, Stump the DJ. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm going to say to buy an undervalued apartment in an undervalued neighborhood. Like a sketchy neighborhood? I'm not a big fan of the word sketchy. Was it sketchy when you bought it? Were your parents like, are you sure you're going to live there? No, but my parents don't know the neighborhood very well. Well, I'll give you a good example of that. When my sister, you, you're from Philadelphia. When my sister was at Penn, they lived off campus in a really beautiful house in a horrible neighborhood. And my sister said to me, if mommy and daddy knew where I lived, they would never let me live there. So is it something like if you transplanted it into Philadelphia, would your parents have been like, uh, you know what? I don't think we really want you to live there. I don't think so. Right. No, I don't think so. It was just a neighborhood that, you know, like middle and upper middle class white people don't live in. But I don't think it was a dangerous neighborhood. All right. So good. And you still live there? I still live there. All right. All right. So this is a fascinating book. I found myself a little bit angry, even though in the beginning of the book, you say no judgments, like don't judge. I'm reading through the book and I'm thinking like, why should you have anxiety if you have affluence? What was the root cause of the anxieties that you encountered by interviewing these 50-some people? Yeah, I think there's a couple of different root causes. I mean, one of them is the fact that we live in this moment of high economic inequality that is not only high, you know, for the last couple of decades and been growing for the last couple of decades, but also uh, now much more publicly visible. So Occupy Wall Street, the Great Recession, the Bernie Sanders campaign, all of that sort of brought inequality to the fore in a way that I think is hard for people to deal with. That said, I don't think it's only this kind of more contemporary political and cultural environment that is influencing the way these people are talking about their wealth. I think there's also a, a longer standing kind of stigma of wealth in some cases. And what I argue in the book is that, you know, the people that I talk to try to be morally worthy of their wealth because it's so easy to be seen as unworthy, right? There's so many judgments. These aren't the judgments that you made, I don't think, but it's very common to judge wealthy people for over-consuming, for being ostentatious, for being materialistic, right? What they do with their money, not giving away enough money, not having worked hard enough for their money or not working once they get the money. Um, for you know, the people that I interviewed are very concerned about their kids being kind of entitled brats. You know, they're all trying to avoid 
the word entitlement, the feeling of entitlement. And that, I think, is is the stigma itself, right? That sense of being entitled. It was interesting because you also point out that they break down into two sides, a downward versus an upward tilt. Can you talk a little bit about what each of those does for the people who see their lens of their wealth through those different orientations. Yeah. And maybe I can just say a little bit about who I talked to, actually, because I think the book has been mischaracterized as being only about super wealthy people. And that's not exactly right. So I talked to people, almost all of them are in the top 1%. I talked to 50 people in 42 households, and most of them are in the top 1% with incomes over $500,000 a year, assets of over $3 million. But, you know, there's a big range between people with $500,000 income and people with $10 million income, which I also talked to, or people have $3 million in assets and people have $50 million in assets. So, so there is a range, and I want to be clear about that. And there's also a lot of variation between people who work in high, who, ha- who are in high-earning families, typically in finance and related industries, um, and those who have inherited wealth and are more likely to be working in the arts or in, you know, creative professions and academia, nonprofits and so on. There's several different kinds of variation in the sample, but those are some important ones. The people that I talk about as upward oriented are more likely to be the finance families, not exclusively, and they're people who tend to compare themselves to others like them or people who have more than they do. Did you find any of these people who were comfortable like the you had these 50 interviews right mm-hmm. uh, 42 families were there was there someone who just sort of like felt because com- I read this and I felt like everyone's uncomfortable in his or her own skin it was like it made me anxious for them <laughs> I mean I really did I'm like dude go to therapy and get over this right but were there some who just kind of wore it better and more comfortable in it all Yeah, that's definitely true. And some of them do go to therapy and some of them have gotten over it. So some of the more kind of liberal inheritors or progressive inheritors have talked about this in therapy. They're more like they were more likely to talk about it with me because they were often more used to talking about it in some kind of community that they already had or with their therapist or whatever. Um, And I think that they also felt more explicitly this discomfort. Not everybody talks about it so explicitly. And I don't want to give the impression that people are just walking around being tortured all the time. I think that they Mostly they live their lives and it's only when, you know, some weird interviewer like me comes and talks to them about it that they have to articulate any of these feelings. So they are they're still living their privileged lives in a relatively comfortable way. It's so funny. One of the things that you talked about is that people have such great ambivalence. I see that more with the women who are my contemporaries than the men. Where I experience it, I think you identify in the book, is that, you know, friends of mine who are married to people who are really well off or made a ton of money and they opt out and they, you know, like I went to Harvard Law School or I went to Stanford or I went to Brown and I had this degree and I had a career and now I'm taking a left off of that road. And that's when I hear the most, it's like shame almost. Like, I, well, I mean, but like, I I know I should, and but I, uh, Can you talk a little bit about those folks, especially the women? I should say that most people that I talk to, like I have a lot of stay-at-home moms in exactly that category, married to men who are earning high salaries. And then I have a lot of these liberal inheritors. And those are both groups that are more likely, I think, to feel these conflicts, although I think they feel them usually in different ways, than the men who are highly paid in finance. I have fewer of those in the sample. They're harder to get to because they don't have any time because they're working all the time. And I think they're less likely to talk about this. And one interesting fact related to the question is that some of these women said, I'm not going to tell my husband that I talked to you because he would kill me. He's so private. Or they would say, I can't tell you our total assets because you know my husband would be very upset. So There is a way in which I think men maybe at least are perceived by their wives as being more private about some of this than they are, which doesn't necessarily mean more conflicted. But Mm -hmm. it does, you know, it does speak to their they're not just like, yes, let it all hang out. You know, I'm rich and it's great. So that said, I think that these women, it's really challenging You know, I grew up and you grew up in a moment where women who came from privilege, you know, a lot of privilege or just kind of middle or upper middle class background were expected to get educated and they were expected to work. Right. So women who aren't doing that, it's not like the the kind of old upper class, you know, of like my grandmother who 
would not have considered working for money, right? That would have been bad. And so the fact that she didn't do that, I don't think, I mean, I doubt that she ever thought for a single moment that she would have liked to do that or that she was less of a person because she was doing that. But when you're educated to do that and you do do it, I mean, these women had all worked in most of them as lawyers or in finance and, you know, like significant professional occupations. It is hard then to be like, what am I doing with myself? Because you're not really socially valued. Then they're contending at the same time with, I think, very strongly negative social images of wealthy women, especially wealthy women who don't work, right? They're dilettantes. They just go to spin class all day. They just get their nails done. They're not even really taking care of their own kids because they have, you know, nannies and household help. And so they don't even get the kind of symbolic benefit of mothering, which is, you know, still really highly valued. So they're working against that. I mean, they talk to me about everything they do. They think it's work. They want to represent it as work, even though it's unpaid work. It feels like that's how we get into this weird helicopter parenting in some respects, because, like, I am now going to become a professional mom. You know, since I'm not working, I am now going to be so hyper involved in my kid's life that I'm going to essentially, like, be a teammate on Junior's growth. So that's kind of like, to me, one of the big downsides, you know, whatever. My mother worked ish, kind of, you know, she was a teacher, then she did some real estate. But, you know, we just like go do your thing. She, you know, oh, yo, you had to go, you're going to apply to college. Great. Let me know how that goes. And, and that was that. So I think that this is a, an interesting and thorny topic, especially for women. I know it is for men. And I know men, friends of mine who have some money, who have a, that big fear, of like, I don't want my kid to be a baby or a wimp or entitled and all of those things. But it just seems like the position of the woman who walks off the professional track is is really fraught. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that that's, you know, it's partly the helicopter parenting. You see them very involved in their in their kids' lives. It's also home renovation, which was a focus of a lot of these interviews. You know, I interviewed also some people who kind of help wealthy people with their lives, like interior designers, you know, financial planners and people like that. And I had an interior designer say to me, you know, women make renovation their job, right? They just turn it into they they want to do something meaningful. They're skilled. They know how to run projects, right? This is what they do. And I just want to point out, you know, women, these women are caught in a difficult structural situation, something that's been pointed out by sociologists studying this whole opt out revolution, which is that. It, many of them would like to work, but the truth is they are still primary parents, and you know, almost all of them. Their husbands have these jobs that are very time-consuming that often require a lot of travel, so they can't have those kinds of jobs themselves unless they want to radically restructure their household, which I think they don't want to do and their husbands don't want to do. And the jobs that they were in initially before they had kids don't exist in a part-time fashion, right? right? So it's not just like, oh, they're lazy and they don't want to work. It's that there's no way for them to participate in the way that they've been trained to do. The other thing I want to mention is the ways in which their husbands, you know, and there's a, a lot of a chapter about this in the book, the ways that they really depend on their husbands to recognize their labor as like real labor, right? And they have conflicts with their husbands that appear to be conflicts about money often. The husband is often like, why are you spending so much money? And the wife is like, but I cut my own hair and I'm just spending money on the kid and you told me to buy X and Y, you know. But I think a lot of it is because the husbands don't really understand what the wives are doing and they don't see the ways that they're maintaining the family's lifestyle as legitimate. Again, as they would, like my grandfather would have seen that as legitimate with my grandmother. Um, but many of these men I think don't. And the ones who do, the wives who say, you know, my husband says we have a perfect division of labor. He respects everything I do. He would never track how much money I spend. You know, they are happy in that relationship, but they still see that as a possibility. The, the, the fact that the person who brings the money to the relationship ultimately does control the money, mm -hmm. um, I think, is really plays out in these, especially in those families. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to our interview with Rachel Sherman in just a minute. But, you know, it is the season of giving. And by the way, one way you can feel a lot better about your wealth, if you're listening to this and you're really rich and you have anxiety, one really good way to feel better about it is to give some money away. Well, this is great news because Betterment, our sponsor, the largest independent online financial advisor, has a brand new way to help you donate appreciated shares to charities. It's the new charitable giving feature. 
we've talked about this on the show. I mean, one of the beautiful things about the tax code, and it remains in the tax code, is that you can make a lot of money in a taxable account on a stock or a mutual fund or a bond. And if you gift it to a charity, you don't have to pay the tax due on the gain. And because you're giving it to a nonprofit, the charity itself doesn't have to pay the tax on the gain. Donating shares is more tax efficient than donating cash, and the charity doesn't need to pay a processing or a transaction fee to a third party. So they receive 100% of the donation. Go check out Betterment.com to learn more about the charitable giving feature. And now back to our interview with Rachel Sherman. Can you talk a little bit about that philanthropy track and that how people, the the stay at homers or even some of the folks who have inherited wealth, what what does that track do? Does that legitimize your wealth? Well, I'm on the 14 boards. And I mean, I don't know, like, you know, if you're the Bass family, you've been doing that for, you know, a couple hundred years, probably. But what are these people that you interview? What are they doing around philanthropy and what does that do to help legitimize their wealth. Yeah. I mean, being philanthropic, charitable, giving back, you know, these are elements of being morally worthy. So I kind of alluded to the other elements, which are working hard, even if you're not paid or even if you're an inheritor, being able to think of yourself as working hard and then also interpreting your consumption as reasonable, right? Not being over the top. And so then the the third element is this kind of broad category of giving back. And I think people dealt with that very differently some of these stay-at-home moms in these finance families, they did give away, you know, what's a significant amount of money to give away? I mean, something... Well, if you're going to be like, all right, so if I'm Catholic, I'm tithing, it's 10%, Yeah, right? nobody's giving away 10%. <laughs> I was actually surprised at how little they, they gave are... away relative to their incomes, right? right. That they can be giving away $50,000. The wealthiest people in my sample may be a quarter of a million dollars. I think even somebody gives away maybe half a million dollars a year, a million. Um, but these are people who are earning tens of millions of dollars a year. I mean, who have assets, you know, certainly above 50 million. I, th- I think quite a lot above that. So what's the right number? You know, that's a complicated conversation. But yeah, they definitely see that practice as important. The stay-at-home moms that we were just talking about are also very likely to do volunteer work, which I think speaks to your question about the job too, right? And they're very involved in their kids' schools. They're not so much volunteering like outside of their own communities. So Mm -hmm. in a way, what they're doing is reproducing their kids' own advantage. They're not sitting in a soup kitchen and uh, or a methadone clinic and helping out. Maybe like once a year they would do that, you know, take the kids at Thanksgiving or something. But Mm -hmm. no, they're not doing that on a regular basis. And they're not doing other kinds of more kind of active social change work, people in this group. So the volunteering is is pretty limited to their own communities. But then, you know, the people who are more downward oriented also can give away a lot of money, are more likely to give it away anonymously, because even though they're more open with me about their discomfort, they're less publicly, you know, they, they, they don't want to be identified publicly as super wealthy people. Um, and they're less likely to volunteer in schools. One thing that I think is really fascinating is how many of these people across the board gave a lot of money to their own alma maters, their colleges, and their kids' private schools, right? So I have always kind of thought, like, God, my alma mater, how much can it possibly need my they money? They need you. I just got solicited by development out of our, our mutual alma well, they, mater. Sure. I mean, they always need you, but <laughs> the fact that you're going to give money to, you know, Harvard or something that has a, whatever, $30 billion endowment— um, I've just always been really struck by that, you know. So, of course, people are identified with those institutions in a way it makes sense. But the more liberal kind of downward facing people are more likely to be giving to more progressive causes, too, that are making kind of trying to make more systemic change, not of the soup kitchen variety. Mark and I were laughing because somebody came in here who is very hardworking. I said, you know, just Google this name. And I had him Google the name. And he's like, oh, my God. That person's spouse is a billionaire with a B. Mm. And we talked about how she's so normal. Mm. I I can't tell you, like, did not seem to be, look, I don't know. I didn't ask her about this. But, you know, no worse for wear. Just seems to kind of wear it pretty easily and grew up lower middle class Mm. and continues to have a career and speaks very frankly. But I, I wonder what it is about someone's particular, maybe it's just her personality, but what makes people more comfortable with their positions that yeah. that happen out of the blue? Because, I mean, it could be like a windfall for any reason. It could be you married somebody. It could be your own windfall. Yeah, it's hard to say. I, I do think that that's a personality, maybe more of a personality thing. I remember I interviewed this one woman 
whose husband makes like $3 million. She grew up in the New York suburbs somewhere, you know, upper middle class, kind of maybe a little bit lower than that. Her husband was kind of lower middle class. And she did not seem conflicted to me at all. And I just kept feeling like, where's the conflict, you know? <laughs> But in fact, I think she had found this middle ground. In a way, she was aware of people below her. Her kids went to public school, although I very much doubt that they will continue to do that when they're a little bit older. She was often, but she was often talking about decisions that they had made about spending money that felt like they were in the middle. You know, we'll spend $3,000. I can't remember. We'll spend $3,000 on a hotel suite for, you know, the whole family for however much time, but we won't fly first class. Or, you know, there are these sort of trade offs that felt very in the middle. And she felt like they appreciated having their money way more than many of her husband's colleagues did because they're all, you know, they were all like complaining they didn't get paid more millions of dollars. And they thought that, you know, she and her husband thought that was ridiculous. So there's a way that compared to the people around them, they're being very moderate, but then they're still a little bit tied into the roots. So, so that's one example of somebody who seems more comfortable. Before you started this project, how would you have described your own upbringing? Would you have said middle class, upper middle class? How would you have described it? I would have said upper middle class. And my upbringing is interesting because I have a kind of class. I come from a mixed class family, if that's a thing. Um, My father's family is wealthy, not super wealthy, but he grew up wealthy. And my mother's family is you know, lower middle class, especially in terms of um, her parents were college educated, but they did not have very much money and always worked and, you know, struck really struggled economically. And when I was growing up, I benefited from, you know, my grandparents paid for me to go to private school my whole life and they paid for me to go to an Ivy League college. And I saw my mom had sort of chosen because she was a playwright and she had chosen to kind of pursue that. And she gave up a tenured job in academia in order to do that. So in a sense, she chose to, you know, she could have, she didn't have to be kind of economically challenged, but she was. And so I grew up and I grew up with, you know, my parents were divorced, but I grew up with both of them more or less equally. And so I had the lifestyle of an upper middle class person with the, but always living with my mom who had the lifestyle of like a lower middle class person for most of my childhood. And she really struggled to make ends meet too. And I think that's where my interest in some of this comes from. And I've had conversations with other people about this too. And some of the people that I interviewed, you know, when you have an experience, when you're privileged and you have an experience that is meaningful, not like somebody took you to a soup kitchen for 10 minutes, of people who don't have privilege, then you you start to see your own privilege in a different way. And that experience can happen, you know, in it can take multiple forms. But I think it's common for people who have had that then to be more aware of this, their position. Well, I mean, I think it's really fascinating. I think that when I was growing up, I think that my father would say we're upper middle class. And I, I came home once and I said, you know, actually, no, we're upper class. Yeah. And and he goes, no, we're not. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we kind of are, Dad. Like, you know, I'm not saying that I, I didn't grow up with millions, but I'm just saying that, like, you could see the way I could find the contrast was not because I went to, you know, in a, a an elite public school outside of New York, but that I played sports. Mm-hmm. And the people I played sports with in all these different communities on all these different teams were from all over the place. And it was very clear what middle class was. And that was not us. Mm -hmm. And I think that my father was sort of shocked because I think he always wanted to be like the man of the people. And he didn't actually like, you know, he's the guy who is like, really, like, I want to like, make sure that the guy at the garage is taken care of. And I want to do like he was very into that. And I and I thought he's just not comfortable with it. Exactly. He's just not. He was never comfortable with it. And his father had money. And so he grew up like poor little rich boy, poor, too bad. Um, You know, but it's really interesting. When I was reading this, I thought about how when you're in these communities, when everyone is the same and you do compare up or you compare down, like what are the what are the things that you can expose your kids to to help them? And actually, I really do believe sports was like the great leveler for me Mm -hmm. that we get. I just met a gazillion different type of people from all over the place. And even though I was at an elite school. When you're playing soccer at Brown University and there's someone there from who's a recruited from Florida who has no money, who's an amazing soccer player, and you get to be friends with them, you're mm-hmm. like, oh, that's a whole different life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think sports, I mean, that's exactly the kind of experience I'm talking about where you have a little bit of, a, of an exposure to people who are different from you. That is meaningful, right? That's not just like, oh, look at the poor kids and, you know, appreciate your advantages, which is what I think a lot of these parents end up having to do. Rachel Sherman, we started the program, and I asked you what was your best 
financial decision, and it was you said that you bought an apartment um, undervalued. So many people answer that question, by the way, with a real estate response. It cracks me up. And you're ready for your, your, your bookend question. What's the worst financial decision you ever made? You got nervous there for a second. You well, had no, no idea where I, I was literally going. cannot think of a bad financial decision. I, I mean, it, it's related to the conversation because I really, my, it was my dad who taught, and despite of the fact that it was my mom who had less money, it was my dad who really, you know, made me drop up a budget for my allowance. And, you know, I had to like give away money to, you know, to other people when I was young. And when I, I went to grad school at Berkeley and I moved there in 1994, and I think not buying some piece of real estate uh, at that moment, yeah. where I never would have thought of myself as a financial actor and as, you know, in my early 20s. But if I had done that, I would I would be more financially secure now. Yeah, I guess you seem to be doing very yeah, well. Yeah, I'm fine. Do you have I'm any anxiety? Fine. Do you have any anxiety over your own affluence? I do. Yeah, I mean, I share some of these some of the characteristics that I've been talking about. Um, I, I mean, I just try. I also try to be like one of these, you know, morally good affluent people. I'm not as affluent as the people in my sample. And I should also say, in terms of my own background. You know, my dad never made a lot of money, so he just came from a family that had money. So that was also – I didn't even realize that until I was probably older than I should have been. <laughs> um, but, yeah, to think about, you know, what it means to have uh, have plenty in a world where people have so little mm-hmm. and how w- – what can you do about that as an individual? And, you know, I'm really interested in that question. Rachel Sherman, Uneasy Street is the name of the book, The Anxieties of Affluence. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Well, it's time for our listener question of the week. And remember, you've got two chances to get on the program. We like to ha- talk to you as much as possible. You know what, Mark? Maybe we should do a third listener. Oh, I'm not, he's, make, he's rolling his eyes at me. Anyway, if you have a financial question, let us know. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. I'll put on my certified financial planner hat and and I've got a robe because I'm the senior CFP board ambassador. I don't have a robe. I'm just kidding. Uh, Right now, we're going to talk to Karen. She is in Austin, Texas, and I've already told her that this is a place I want to visit. So depending on how this call goes, I might get an invitation to come to Austin. So Karen, welcome to Better Off. What can I do for you? Well, I wanted to ask you, as far as like finances go, what really is the right order of of how we should be focusing our our money? So, you know, after you do retirement, after you do kids college fund, where what else? What should we focus on? Okay, now, so you're saying a we. So, is there a partner in the picture here? Yes, I have a husband. Husband? How old is he? Um, he's fifty one. How old are you? Forty seven. And you got some kids who are how old? Um, 15 and 8. Whoa. Yeah. Look at you with a big gap. This is, I'm sure that the 8-year-old was perfectly planned, uh, just like everything in life. Uh, okay. Tell me, uh, tell me about what you guys do for a living. Um, well, my husband, he's actually in between jobs right now. So he is, he's quite, he has a business on the side, but he's still looking for a better, more permanent work. And so, um, his, I mean, he, with that business, he brings in a little bit each month, but, um, would like to do better. I'm a pharmacist. So, and that's our, most our steady income right there. How much do you earn, Karen? Um, 165 a year. That's great. And, uh, do you work for a big company or do you work for yourself? How does that work? I work for a big company. Mm -hmm. And you got a 401k? Yes, ma'am. I love ma'am. So you're (laughs) being a little Texan for me right now. Uh, Are you maximizing it? Are you putting the most you possibly can? I do. I put, yes. So you're putting out at 18. Great. And how much is in the 401k total? For me um, right now, about it's pretty close to 225,000. Great. Perfect. Husband and his retirement accounts, what's going on? He does have an IRA that he contributes to. So right now with that, we probably have about um, a little bit over 300000 Meaning, so wait a second, you mean he's got seventy five in addition to your two twenty five, or he's got three hundred? No. Yeah, it's it's about around three hundred thousand. All right, so he's got three hundred thousand, you've got two twenty five. You have a house? We have a house, uh huh. Yes, How much would you guess it's worth? I would say probably uh probably closer to about four hundred thousand. Is there an outstanding mortgage on the house? Unfortunately. <laughs> Don't be unfortunate, it's good. It's like you're leveraging your money. This is fine. Don't worry. What's the out- outstanding amount? 
Um, a little. We'd probably say right about two ninety eight right now, two hundred ninety eight thousand. And what's the interest rate on that mortgage? Three point five. Oh, so cheap. Okay. Uh, kids are young, heading to college ish for fifteen year old. Uh, are you saving right now for college? I am not a lot. I, I mean, I wish we could do more, but I've kind of been focusing more on retirement right now. He, we probably have about thirty-five thousand set aside for him. Mm-hmm. Is he going to hook him horns? Yes, oh, absolutely. He wants to go to UT. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure I could use the right lingo. So, I mean, do you have any other debt besides that mortgage? Well, we have a small car loan, um, but because it's only at, like the interest rate is one point six five percent, I haven't rushed. I mean, I will pay it off next year, but okay. I haven't haven't rushed on that one. But no credit card, no old student loans of your own. No, uh-huh. oh, that's great. Do you have an emergency reserve fund? Just a little stash of cash somewhere. I probably should do add more. So if you tell me I need to work on that first, I'm mm-hmm. not going to understand. Okay. We have about 11000 in a savings account, and then we have about 17000 in a taxable brokerage account. Where's that taxable brokerage account? Are you, like, playing on the side with some money, or what's going on uh, there? We, we have that betterment. <laughs> ah, very good. Okay, perfect. Here's Here's what I would say. If you looked at your all of your expenses on a monthly basis, what would you put that number at? Um, the, the biggest chunk is the is the mortgage because we have a fifteen year, so we're trying to get rid of that. Um, uh, roughly, probably about maybe five or six thousand is what we okay. live on. Okay, that's all right. The way that you do the calculation for your emergency reserve fund is you take your major expenses, or I wouldn't even say your 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 like day to day household expenses, whether it's five thousand or six thousand, whatever number you want to use, and you say okay. I need six months worth of that in a safe, accessible account. Now, you're you're pretty close, right? Because you got 28,000. I mean, I think that it would be good for you to have 30 or 40,000. And, you know, your husband's out of work or in between jobs right now. So the fact that you haven't, like, sucked all the money out of that cash account tells me you're living pretty reasonably within your means, which is great. So when you're talking about the order, here's the right order that I always like to think about. Okay. Number one is I like people to be consumer debt free. Um, the mortgage, don't prepay that. You don't okay. need to prepay that because in my in my experience, the the need for cash flow, extra money every month is more important, especially when you have a couple of kids, because if you start worrying about paying down the mortgage, what you're not going to do is save for college. There's only True. so much money. So you're so right. the order is. We like to be consumer debt free. We have to have an adequate emergency reserve fund. We want to max out retirement. You're doing that. You're doing your 18 grand. There's one reason to look forward to turning 50, by the way. Do you know what that is? <laughs> right. You can put extra money in. <laughs> you know, it's like it's it's a double edged sword. It's 50, but it's an extra six grand in your 401k. Once you have those big pieces taken care of, that's when you could start putting more money away for college. You know, are you using a 529 account or just what, how are you doing it? Right. Well, I have, we have one set up for both. For Great. Child. Okay. Yeah. So I think that that would be your next step. And the reason why I love the 529 and people have heard me talk about it on the show before, and that is it is essentially like having a Roth IRA for your kid's education. The money goes in, it's post-tax. I understand that. But it's used for college. When it comes out, there's no tax due. So no accumulation, no worries about that. I mean, obviously, being in state, if you were able to go to UT, it's not free, but it's not going to be 60 grand a year. So I think that that you're in great shape. And then hopefully when your husband lands a job, he'll then get back into putting money away diligently into his retirement account. And if you said to me, we have a choice, let's say that you're you know, he gets a job tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And you say, okay, what should we do? Should we max out his retirement and put 24000 in there? Or should we put money in the 529 plan? I would prefer him to max out retirement first. Okay. And presuming he does that, then the 529. Okay, afterwards. Okay, and yep. then in, in the meantime, should we still be just stocking up our savings account after we get that car loan paid Yes, then, I think so. I okay. think that makes sense. Again, you want six months of your expenses in the bank. How long have you been working with your company? 
Uh, almost five years. Okay. I mean, it's not that you, you know, you've got some good tenure, but things happen. So what I would say is better to be safe, keep a little extra money in savings. And then okay. from there, we can layer on different things. Could okay. be college, could be a supplemental account. It could be, you know, a second home, but all these things are in the works for you. You've got a great jump on your savings for college. You've got a good chunk of money in retirement and it's only going to get better. So I think you sound like you're in very good shape. Just do me one favor. Don't be compulsive about paying down that mortgage. You are that you I want to. (laughs) I know. I know. You know why? Because emotionally it feels awesome. You're still going to collect your mortgage interest deduction. So let the government help you save for college, essentially. Like that three and a half percent mortgage probably only costs you two and a half percent. And if you're putting that extra money into retirement and funding something in 30 years from now, you're likely to do better than that. So I think you've got like what we call a perfect arbitrage. You are going to keep that three and a half percent loan and push that money into your retirement accounts and be a good long-term investor. You're not going to mess with it too much and you're going to be in terrific shape. You know, I guess that it's important for me to ask you this question at this moment. What is the best allergy medication? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) You're in great shape, Karen, the pharmacist. I promise. Okay, good. That's what I want to know for sure. All right. Well, give us a call back if you have any other questions, but um, I think you're on the right track. Oh, good. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Thanks so much to Rachel Sherman. She's a professor and author of Uneasy Street, The Anxieties of Affluence. And thanks to you for listening. Don't forget, we've got our bonus episode that comes out on Tuesdays and the longer form every single Thursday. You can subscribe via iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at Jill on Money. That's at Jill on Money. Just use the hashtag better off. You can also reach me via email, askjill at betteroffpodcast.com. That's askjill at betteroffpodcast.com. And if you wouldn't mind, please leave us a review or a rating in iTunes. It really will help us out. Better Off is sponsored by Betterment. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Delercio produces. I'm Jill Schlesinger. See you next week. <laughs>